Ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome to stage Michael Keyes. Thanks, Matt. Some time ago, I was reading something that George Bernard Shaw wrote, and he said, and it really interested me, and he said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. And therefore, all progress, not some, but all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Now, this is a bit of an old-fashioned idea, I know. But then again, I am the oldest person here on stage today, so I reckon I can say that. <laughs> and my old-fashioned idea is this. Is that we've got to expect more out of ourselves. We've got to expect more out of those around us. And we've got to expect more out of life itself. The bottom line is we must expect more. But why don't we? Because we're afraid to create disappointments. We're afraid to step outside our comfort zone. And I believe we need to bring back an old-fashioned quality. And that's the quality of unreasonable expectations. History is filled with people who had the courage to have unreasonable expectations, to do the unusual, to do the unexpected. And I believe the power of un, as opposed to the power of one, and apologies to Bryce, is the single most important galvanising force on the planet. Churchill, on the eve of the Second World War, he said, the Battle of France is over and the Battle of Britain is about to begin. And, and we will have victory at all costs. And should our British Empire last for 1,000 years, let it be said that this was our finest hour. Churchill had unreasonable expectations of his people, unreasonable expectations of his country, unreasonable expectations of his military. And because of him being such an unreasonable man, he changed the course of the Second World War. It's with great reverence. I remember when Disney first began. Well, not when Disney first began, but when the Disney show first came on TV. And I remember watching the Disney show. My mum would get us rugged up in front of the TV on those cold winter nights the fire would be going and she'd cook us up chicken noodle soup and you can just smell that chicken noodle soup cooking now, can't you? It's just beautiful. And then the Disney show would come on. And I just want to play you a little bit of music to see whether what memories it brings back for you. Mitch, can you just play that please? Does it bring back some memories? Yeah. Does it? Yeah, I hope it does. When I went looking for this music in the record shops, well, the music shops, anyway, when I went looking for this music, <laughs> and the kids in these shops, my goodness me, they had facial art, like unbelievable. They had studs, they had rings. One guy had a chain from his ear to his nose. I don't know what he used that for, but anyway, he had it there. <laughs> And yet, when I, and the big earrings, you know, the big stretchy earrings? And when I mentioned Disney, their faces lit up. And they started telling me about their favourite Disney show, their favourite Disney character, and their favourite Disney movie. How does that legacy live on? Because Disney was the unreasonable man. When he was asked how he achieved so much in one lifetime, he said, I dream, I believe, I dare, I do. He had unreasonable dreams. He had unreasonable beliefs. And when he dared to have a go, my goodness, did he have a go. Who would have thought in a little town 40 kilometres outside of Los Angeles, in the desert, you could create a land of wonder, create a land of magic, a land where dreams come true, and where just about every child on the planet has it on their bucket list to visit there at least once in their lifetime. I know I did. When I was five years old, sitting there watching that black and white TV set and it showed little snippets of Disneyland. I said, one day I'm going to be there. I'm going to walk through the front gates of Disney Anaheim. And 32 years later, I walk through the front gates of Disney Anaheim and I yell out, Walt, I'm here, I've arrived, I'm here. Now, Walt didn't come and greet me. And there's no brass band in Bunning, but I'm excited. I'm so excited that I want to share my excitement with our three kids. So I turn around to share my excitement with the kids. And the kids are fighting. How can this be? We're in the happiest place on earth. I turn around again, they're having a blue. 
So I get them down to a huddle. I remember I got the facade of Disney behind them. And I said, kids, you know, Dad's been dreaming of this day since he's been five years old. <laughs> and Dad is really excited about being here today. It's a goal. And Mum and Dad have saved for the last five years to be able to afford to bring us here. This is the happiest place on earth. <laughs> so you will have a good time. And every time I turn around, I want to see a smile on your faces from ear to ear. Do you understand me? They go, yes, Dad. And I walk off. I take about 10 paces. I turn around to check on the kids. And Jessica, our beautiful nine-year-old daughter, she's strutting the stuff. She says, oh, oh, Dad's having a smile check. Dad's having a smile check. <laughs> Boy, smile check. And so, and so smile check is something that's lived on in our family. And yes, it was unreasonable to think that a father had to get his kids to fake a smile in Disneyland to have a good time. But I did. And they had a good time. Their physiology changed. Endorphins were released. And they had a great time that day and every day we were in Disneyland. And I believe we need to have unreasonable expectations to have a smile check in our life every day so our endorphins are changed, our physiology changes. And we can smile our way to good health and happiness. The legacy of Disney lives on today. 58 years on from when Disney first began, no, Disneyland was first opened, and 90 years from when Disney first began. Why? Because Walt Disney had unreasonable expectations about from his, what he wanted from his staff. He had unreasonable expectations about what they would produce. He had unreasonable expectations about creating happiness throughout the world. He had unreasonable expectations of himself. He was the unreasonable man. I don't choose to call it much, but I had a little bug, and that little bug was called leukemia. And it was a reasonable little bug in an unreasonable little body. Well, the body's not so little anymore, but anyway. And uh, I, uh, I had unreasonable doctors I had unreasonable specialists, I had unreasonable nurses, and I had unreasonable treatment. And because of all those people being unreasonable, and the treatment being unreasonable, I stand before you today. And I reckon I'm the most blessed person on the planet to be standing here now doing this. You see, it all started on a Friday. I get up and I go to work. It's a good way to start the day. And uh, I wasn't feeling too good, so I went to the doctor. The doctor says, we'll take some tests. So the doctor took some tests and he called me back about lunchtime. That's when I found out it's not, get, not good to get called back the same day to the doctor. And he said, he said, Michael, you might have leukemia. I thought, no way. There's no way possible that I could have leukemia. So I did what I always do when I'm feeling a bit crook. And that's how I got to work. I went to work. I went into denial. I got to work that afternoon. And I sold a house that afternoon. And I felt better now. <laughs> and then I thought, I know what will cure this leukemia bug. A punnet of strawberries. I had a craving for a punnet of strawberries. So I went to the shop, bought a punnet of strawberries and scoffed them down. Didn't work though. That night I ended up in the Royal Adelaide Hospital, flat on my back for 42 days. I get fully diagnosed over the weekend. Monday the treatment starts and I'm shifted into isolation. Hospital life is very routine. Every four hours, six times a day, you get your vitals taken. So four o'clock on Tuesday morning, they wake me up. They take my vitals and I'm left lying awake in that cold, dark isolation room. And I couldn't go back to sleep because all I was thinking about was the chemotherapy for the new day. And then an amazing thing happened. At first it was quite faint, but I hear a little bird singing. And it sang and it sang and it sang. And it must have sang its lungs out because I had double glazed glass. <laughs> and it sang. And it put me off into a beautiful, peaceful sleep. I need to be awoken by the nurses at 8 o'clock. So I go through that day and I have all the treatment. Following morning, I get woken at 8 o'clock. Uh, it's four o'clock, sorry. Four o'clock. They take my vitals, take my blood. And, uh, and I'm lying there thinking about the treatment I've got to have for the next day and I'm not looking forward to it. And then I wonder, just before dawn, I wonder whether my little friend's going to come and sing for me again today. And sure enough, 
It did. It sang for me that day and every day I was in hospital. And it gave me a beautiful, peaceful sleep. And it gave me hope for the new day. And yes, it's unreasonable to expect a little bird could have such an impact on my recovery, but it did. And I believe we need to have unreasonable expectations to appreciate all the small things in life. When somebody makes us a cup of coffee, we've got to be able to say, yes, thank you. When somebody gives us away, gives way for us in traffic, we've got to be able to say, yes, thank you. We need unreasonable expectations to appreciate all the hidden treasures that we have in life. But it began way before that for me. My father was a disciplinarian. He made us kids work when other kids were playing. And we never begrudged it because that's what was expected of us. And I say leadership is all about that. Leadership is about having unreasonable expectations. And I believe the best boss I've ever had, and I'm sure you'll be the same, is the boss who had unreasonable expectations of us. In, in fact, the boss that expected more of us than we thought we were capable of ourselves. But then when we reached the target, when we achieved the goal, weren't we just so grateful that somebody had the faith in us to achieve that target and that goal? To stretch us? In fact, I think this is why Apple, Google, Zappos and every successful business and every great entrepreneurship in society today and every great accomplishment that's ever mattered is because somebody has said it's unreasonable. It's unreasonable to be in horse and cart when we can be in cars. It's unreasonable to use snail mail when we can use email. It's unreasonable. Helen Keller was born deaf. She was born blind. She couldn't communicate with the outside world. And yet she goes on to become one of the most significant philosophers of our time. How does she do that? How does she do that? And she said, what a pity it is for a person to be able to see and yet have no vision. From a blind person? Well, she had a teacher by the name of Ann Sullivan. And Ann Sullivan was a great teacher. And I just want you to imagine for one moment. Sorry, what was your name? Janine. Janine. Nice to meet you, Janine. Do you mind if I hold your hand for one moment? No. Just hold one hand. Now, close your eyes. Just imagine you can't hear. And I'm trying to communicate you with you through stroking your hand and tapping and saying hello. How do I say it's raining outside? How do I say the sun is shining? How do I get through to you to say I'm a friend? Thank you, Janine. Thank you. Open your eyes. <laughs> you see, Helen Keller was a hero. But I believe the real hero in this case was Anne Sullivan. Anne Sullivan was unreasonable in her teaching ability. She was unreasonable in her patience. She was unreasonable in her persistence. Anne Sullivan was the unreasonable person. And this is what I yearn for. This is what life is about. Life is about having expectations. And sure, life will throw you some curveballs and, and set up some disappointments. But it's that expectation of greatness that sets apart a life well lived versus one that's not. I started in real estate sales on, on December the 23rd, 1987. And I didn't do so well. I was average. Michael, you know what this is all about. 1.75 sales per salesperson per month, right? That's what I was doing, or probably even less than that. And everything changed for me in mid-1988. What happened was, I went into a sales slump, and I didn't sell a house for seven weeks. And when you're on a debit credit system, you're starving. Has anybody ever been on a de debit credit system? No? Anyway, you're starving. My wife was hairdressing in our laundry to put food on the table. And I went home one afternoon and I was depressed and I was down and out. She used to call me Eeyore, one of the Disney characters. <laughs> she said I was so depressed. Anyway, so I went home one afternoon and I said to my wife, I'm going to quit, I'm going to resign. She said, yes, Marty, what are you going to do then? You're going to go back on the unemployment queue? Because I was unemployable before that. So I realised I had to make it work and just at that time I found out about a sales seminar I went along and it was like a cloud lifted from me. And I realised I was the unconscious incompetent. I had no idea that I didn't know what I was doing. And I started to learn some things that afternoon, that day. And then I made the best investment I've ever made in my entire life was when I invested $700 of our last $1,000 in this trainer's books and tapes. 
And the reason I did that was he said, if you want wealth and prosperity beyond your wildest dreams, he said, take my books and tapes. Take them. Invest in them. And you can have all the prosperity that you want in your life. I thought, I want that. I want that prosperity. So I remember I was shaking. My hand was shaking when I handed over the credit card. And I took, I took, I paid for it, and I took the books and tapes home, and I listened to the first cassette in the car park. Now, for you young'uns here, a cassette is an ancient listening device, okay? <laughs> you put it into the car, into the cassette deck in the car, and it's got tape in it, it plays. All right? So I listened to it. I go home that afternoon. I said to Tina, my beautiful wife, I said, honey, I've got some great, great news. I've invested in this, all this material. I showed it to her. She said, how much does it cost? I said, $700. She said, what? You better make sure you get your money's worth out of it. You better make sure you study it. So I studied and I studied and I studied. The very next month, I go on to sell 19 individual houses. I averaged 11 house sales a month for many years after that. And then my best sales month ever was 23 sales in one month. And you're probably wondering what changed. Well, my mindset changed for one. And secondly, I learned to ask one question. You see, before, what I was doing was I'd say to somebody, do you want to buy the house? And they'd go, yes. i go, well, you probably want to go away and think about it, don't you? Do you want to go and think about it? Who wants to go and think about it? OK? And they'd go, yeah, we'll go and think about it. That's OK. We're going to think about it. And then they'd never get back to me. And I wouldn't follow them up. So I was sitting in the back of Alan Thomas's car and I said to him, I looked in the rear view mirror because this is exactly what it said on the tapes to do. So I looked in the rear view mirror and I said, Alan, what do you think of the house? He said, I like it. I said, and my stomach was churning and I said, do you want to buy it, Alan? And he said, yes! <laughs> and I was in the back of the car with the kids and the kids got bruised from me being so excited. Next 18 people said yes. When I had my sales real estate office, I expected just four sales per salesperson per month, even though the industry average is just 1.75. Why? Because I wanted them to prosper. And I believe you should go back to any performance group that you're in charge of and get them to double their expectations and see the prosperity flow into your business. My father had unreasonable expectations of himself. He started a winery called Carrawira Wines in 1969, and I was so proud of my dad. I was 10 years old, my brother was 12 years old, and I remember it well because we were made to go and work up there at vintage time, and we were picked up after school. Anyway, so my job was to fork off the grapes out of the crusher. And the reason I got that job was because it required no brains, by the way. <laughs> so, fork off the grapes. My brother's job was inside, helping to clean out the tanks. And the tanks can be quite dangerous because they, they can be filled up with carbon dioxide after the fermenting wine was taken out of them. Anyway, there's a, a cellar hand by the name of Denny Kaufman and my dad. And so they worked inside. Tub was operating the crusher, that's my brother's best mate. And I'm forking the grapes off. And one night, my brother comes running out and he says, help, help, we need help inside. Don't take any notice of him because we thought he was mucking around. Two minutes later, he comes outside and he says, help, I said we need help inside now. So I dropped everything, jump off the back of the truck, and I can remember jarring my knees on the cement floor and run inside to be confronted with the scene. There's Danny Kaufman, head and shoulders above the tank. My brother's trying to pull him out. Dad's standing in the tank trying to push him up. He'd been overcome with the fumes, and we knew we had to get him out of the tank. So the three of us pulling on top and my, and my father down in the tank were able to pull him out and we pulled him out, laid him on the floor. Then we just looked down into the tank to see where Dad is, and Dad has just came over to the ladder, put his arms up, and he gets overcome with the fumes, and he, get, he passes out. And we just have time to grab hold of his arms, and we know that the air at the top of the tank is much better than the air at the bottom of the tank. So there's three of us trying to pull him out. We couldn't budge him. So my brother, against tub and my advice, goes down into the tank to try and pull Dad out to try and push him out while we're pulling. And he couldn't. And he takes one, one breath of that foul air and he, uh, he nearly gets overcome with the fumes and thank goodness he has the common sense to climb out over Dad to, over the tank. 
out of the tank and he's passed out on the floor. So it's just Tub and I holding Dad. Tub says to me, Michael, you're going to have to go and get some help. So I run out to the ute and I try and start the ute and the ute won't start and the battery runs flat. So I run back inside, grab hold of Dad's right arm and, uh, and we can't lift him out. Tub says, Michael, you're going to have to hold your father. I'm going for some help. Now here is a 10-year-old boy, 40 kilos, 110 kilo father holding him up. It wasn't whether I could do it or not, it was how committed was I, and I was committed. So I held him up, and Tub went off on his abandoned motorbike, and I could hear him go off into the darkness looking for help. Then a more terrifying moment I've never had in my entire life was when I let Dad's right arm slip down through his jumper sleeve, and his head goes over to his right-hand side of his body. And for one moment, I thought I was going to drop him. But I didn't. I held on to his left arm for what seemed like an eternity. And it was 22 and a half minutes when I heard Tubbs' band of motorbike coming back, the sweetest sound I've ever heard in my entire life. And then a car pulls up outside. Two men come running down the winery shed. They yell out, we're on our way, Michael, we're on our way. And they get to the tank and they grab hold of Dad's left arm, left arm, and they pull him out of the tank. They say, out the way, kid. And they lay Dad, lay Dad out on the floor. So we've got Dad unconscious, Danny Coffin unconscious, brothers unconscious. And after about 30 minutes, Dad wakes up and he's got a smile on his face from ear to ear. And he says, what are you all doing standing around doing nothing? Get back to work. <laughs> now, Dad survived that night, Denny Colquhoun survived that night, my brother survived that night, they all survived. But the real hero that night was Tub. Tub was the one who held on to Dad while I went out and tried to start the ute. Tub was the one who had the unreasonable expectations of me to hold up my father while he went and got some help. Tub was the one who went off and got the help, who brought back two able-bodied men. Tub was the real hero. And this is the quality that unreasonable people have. You see, some people are afraid to live a life of expectations because they're afraid to create disappointments. Well, I'm afraid to live a conventional life. I'm afraid to live a life where we fit in when we should be standing out. I'm afraid to do the usual when we should be doing the unusual. And I believe we all should have the courage to live with unreasonable expectations in our sales, unreasonable expectations in our leadership, and unreasonable expectations in our customer service and unreasonable expectations in the quality of all our relationships and good things will come into your lives through living with the power of un. Thank you very much.